we focus on the idea of happiness too much. And the, the problem with that is, is that it takes our focus away from aims that would be more productive. It's much better to aim for meaning than for happiness. Best bet is truth. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's always going to do the trick. Right? I mean, sometimes you go fight a dragon and it eats you. And if the if you being eaten wasn't a real possibility, it wouldn't be a real fight. And so you see people, like I've seen people in my clinical practice sometimes. I had one client in particular who was undergoing a particularly vicious divorce with someone who was really seriously inclined to take him out and would do pretty much everything at her disposal to do so. And I strategized with him for about three years. And we did everything, like, and hyper carefully. He was a very conscientious and diligent person. And he put into practice everything that we discussed and strategized. And he still pretty much, he got backed into a corner so hard that I didn't know how to help him anymore. So I would say, however, that he, like, he was a very truthful person throughout that. And one thing he did do was, part of it was a custody battle. And he did manage, despite his decline, in consequence of being repeatedly cornered, I would say, he did manage to establish what I think was a lasting relationship with his kids. So he might have got enough out of what he did to justify it, even though the whole landscape was pretty awful. I think that not lying is your best bet, but life is hard and people get run over. and. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to emerge in any obvious sense triumphant. But if you take the alternative path, path, especially when you're facing severe tribulations, let's say, and you complicate those with deceit, you can be sure that whatever tragedy that you're confronting is going to turn into not only tragedy, but something very much akin to hell. And so you might be able to at least minimize the degree of suffering, even if you can't overcome it or transcend it. And that's something, you know. There is no faith and no courage and no sacrifice in doing what is expedient. What do you say to those viewers that don't pursue their dreams and are locked in their careers because they are too afraid to take risks and pursue something mm -hmm. meaningful? Well, the first thing I would say is, well, you should be afraid of taking risks and pursuing something meaningful but you should be more afraid of staying where you are if it's making you miserable. It's like the first thing you want to do is dispense with the idea that you get to have any, any permanent security outside of your ability to contend and adapt. It's the same issue with children. It's like you're paying a price by sitting there being miserable. And you might say, well, the devil I know is better than the one I don't. It's like, don't be so sure of that. The clock is ticking. Yeah, and if you're miserable in your job now and you change nothing, in five years you'll be much more miserable and you'll be a lot older. But isn't so, it a luxury to pursue what is meaningful? Our viewers have mortgages, they have children, yeah. they have payments and loans. It's well, a luxury to pursue because we, we lack the resources. Well, I don't think, I don't remember now, I'm not talking about what makes you happy. It's a luxury to pursue what makes you happy. It's a moral obligation to pursue what you find meaningful. And that doesn't mean it's easy. It might require sacrifice. If you need to change your job too, let's say you have a family and, 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 and children and, and a mortgage, you have responsibilities. You've already picked up those responsibilities. You don't just get to walk away scot-free and say, well, I don't like my job, I quit. That's no strategy. But what you might have to do is you think, well, this job is killing my soul. All right, so what do I have to do about that? Well, I have to look for another job. Well, no one wants to hire me. It's like, okay. Maybe you need to educate yourself more. Maybe you need to update your, your curriculum vitae, your resume. Maybe you need to overcome your fear of being interviewed. Maybe you need to sharpen your social skills. Like, you, you have to think about these things strategically. If you're going to switch careers, you have to do it like an intelligent, responsible person. That might take you a couple of years of, of, of effort to do properly. I've dealt with hundreds of people in my clinical and consulting practice, and we set a goal, we develop a vision and work towards it and it, it, things inevitably get better for people. So it's not a luxury, it's, it's difficult, it's a moral responsibility and it isn't happiness, it's, it's not, the pursuit isn't for happiness.
It's a moral responsibility mm. to pursue what is meaningful. Absolutely. Yeah. The more radical the necessary change, the more pain that accompanies it, like the more opportunity as well. But, and a lot of what we learn, we learn painfully. And so it's not surprising that people shrink away from learning. We learn in pain and anxiety very frequently. Everyone knows that, it's like the things that really, that you really learned in life. It's like, it was no joy, man. Like it took you out. And so the fact that people flee from that is hardly surprising, but it doesn't help. That's the thing. It just stores up the catastrophe for later. And so the better, the better idea is to eat a little poison every day so that you don't have to overdose in a month. It's something like that. And it is the case that I think because you don't, you aren't forced to, first of all, you don't learn unless you're forced to learn. I know there's alternatives to that. There's the voluntary search for knowledge and, and that's a fine thing and that is an antidote to this. But apart from that, speaking more practically, you tend not to learn unless you're forced to learn and it's, and what you tend to learn by force are difficult lessons. And so people are very prone to not, to not seek that out. It's not surprising, but it's because they don't understand the consequences very well. You know, you, you, it's because maybe it's because they're convinced that there's some way of forestalling the necessary learning and there isn't any way of forestalling it. All you do is make it worse in the future. You make yourself smaller and you make the lesson harder. And so that's why in so many religious doctrines, there's emphasis on humility. You know, and humility isn't to debase yourself. It's to understand that you don't know enough so that your life isn't going to be miserable. And so every chance you get to grab something new that will help you along your way, you should take it as fast as you can. But you have to have a very tragic, I would say, view of reality and also a harsh one because it's not just tragedy, it's also malevolence. You have to understand that those are waiting for you and that makes you desperate enough to learn. And that might be make you desperate enough to fall out of your ideology. But that's, that's a hard way of looking at the world. It beats living through it though. Continual circling in some sense of who you could be. You might notice, for example, that there are themes in your life. You know, when you go back across your experiences, you see you kind of have your typical experience that sort of repeats itself. And there might be variation on it, like a musical theme, but it's, it's like you're, you're circling yourself and getting closer to yourself as you move across time. That's the circumambulation. Now, you remember that for a sec, because we'll go back to it. Okay, so imagine that something glimmers before you. It's an, an interest that's dawning, and you decide, well, first of all, you're paralyzed. You think, well, how do I know if I should pursue that? It's probably a stupid idea. And the proper response to that is, you're right, it probably is a stupid idea, because almost all, all ideas are stupid. And so the, the probability that as you move forward on your adventure that you're going to get it right the first time is zero. It's just not going to happen. And so then you might think, well, maybe I'll just wait around until I get the right idea, and which people do, right? So they're like 40-year-old, 13-year-olds, which is not a good idea. And so they wait around until it's waiting for Godot, until they finally got it right. But the problem is you're too stupid to know when you've got it right. So waiting around isn't going to help. Because even if it, the perfect opportunity manifested itself to you in your incomplete form, the probability that you would recognize it as the perfect opportunity is zero. You might even think it's the worst possible idea that you've ever heard of anywhere. Highly likely. Highly likely. So, so you have, there's, Nietzsche, Nietzsche called that a will, will to stupidity, which I really liked. So, because he thought of stupidity as being, it, you know, it's, it's, you have to take it into account fundamentally and work with it and so and so you can take these tentative steps on your pathway to destiny and you can assume that you're going to do it badly and that's really useful because you don't have to beat yourself up it's pretty easy to do it badly but the thing is it's way better to do it badly than not to do it at all so you you start your path and you think that you're heading you know towards your star and so you go in that direction and then because you're here, the world looks a particular way, but then when you move here, 
the world looks different, and you're different as a consequence of having made that voyage. And so, what that means is that now that thing that glimmers in front of you is going to have shifted its location. Because you weren't very good at specifying it to begin with, and now that you're a little sharper and more focused than you were, it's, it's going to reveal itself with more accuracy to you. And so then, you have to take a, you know, it's almost like a 180 degree reversal. But it isn't, because, you know, you've, I mean, you've gone this far, and that's a long ways to get that far. But that's a lot farther than you would be if you just stayed where you were, waiting. And so it doesn't matter that you overshoot continually. Because as you overshoot, even if you don't learn what you should have done, you're going to continually learn what you shouldn't keep doing. And if you learn enough about what you shouldn't keep doing, then that's tantamount at some point to learning at the same time what you should be doing. So, it's okay. So it's like this. Now, what's cool about it though, I think, is that as you progress, the degree of overshooting starts to decline, right? And that we know that there's nothing hypothetical about that. As you learn a new skill, like even to play, play a song on the piano, for example, you overshoot madly. You're making all sorts of mistakes to begin with, and then the mistakes, they, they disappear. So anyways, the fact that you're full of faults doesn't mean you have to stop. And thank God for that, that's a really useful thing. And the fact that you're full of faults doesn't mean that you can't learn. And so you can posit an ideal, and you're going to be wrong about it, but it doesn't matter, because what you're right about is positing the ideal moving towards it. If the actual ideal isn't conceptualized perfectly, well, first, surprise, surprise, because, like, what are you going to do that's perfect? So, it doesn't matter that it's imperf imperfect, it just matters that you do it and that you move forward. So that's really, that's really positive news as far as I'm concerned, because you can actually do that, right? You can do it badly. Anyone can do that, so that's, that's useful. We're built for struggle, us human beings. You, you're not after um, the bubbles of bliss that Dostoevsky described in, in Notes from Underground. We're built to contend with the world. We're built to contend with reality. You want a challenge, and the best way that you can take on a challenge, because a challenge fortifies you. So you don't want to be secure, you want to be strong. And you get strong by taking on optimal challenges. And so you lay out your destiny in the world and you take the slings and arrows of fate and you make yourself stronger while you're doing so. And you might fail and fortune might do you in, but it's your best bet. And, you know, people have also, people have, had, have extracted unbelievable successes out of catastrophic failures. And so, and I'm not saying that in a naive way. I know perfectly well what happens to people, you know. You're doing fine in life and then you get cancer and then six months later you're dead. And all the heroism in the world isn't going to save you at that point. But that's not the point. That's not the point. Life is bounded by mortality. But that doesn't mean that you don't get out there and contend. And you develop by contending. And you minimize the net amount of suffering in the world. And that's something, man. That's something to do. It helps to read a lot. It really helps to write. So if you want to make yourself articulate, which is a very good idea, then not only should you read, but you should write down what you think. And if you can do that a little bit every day, 15 minutes, maybe you could steal 15 minutes and do it every day. But if you do that for 10 years, you really straighten out your thinking. If you're gonna speak effectively, you have to know way more than you're talking about, you know, so if you, this is often difficult for beginning lectures at university because they'll do a lecture on a topic, but they only know as much as they're saying in the lecture. And they get kind of stuck to their notes because of it. But you want to know 10 times as much as you are saying in the lecture, and then you can specify a stepping path through it and elaborate with the other things that you know. But to do that, you have to do a lot of reading. But you also have to do a lot of reading because that's where the synthesize, that's where the synthesizing comes. So that's on the input side. And then on the output side, well, there's some tricks, techniques, let's say, is like if you're speaking in front of a group, you are not delivering a talk to a group. 
That's not what you're doing. The talk isn't a packaged thing that you present to a group. There isn't a group. There's a bunch of individuals and you talk to them. So when I talk to a group, I always talk to people one at a time. And that makes it easier too, because you know how to talk to a person. It's like, can you talk to a thousand people? Well, probably not, because it's too intimidating. But there isn't a thousand people there. There's a thousand individuals. And so you just look at an individual and you say something and you can tell if they're engaged, they look confused or they look interested or they look angry or they look bored or maybe they're asleep, in which case you look at someone else. And they, they give you feedback about how you're doing. And so one thing is to, to have something to say, yeah. But the next thing is pay attention to who you're talking to. Because unless you're very badly socialized, and that seems unlikely in your case, because you, know, you present yourself at least moderately well, you know. And well, I mean, I don't know you very well, but on first, but on first sight, you know, you're, you're doing fine. So the probability that if you pay attention to the individuals that you're talking to, that your natural wealth of, of social skill will manifest itself is extremely high. And so you don't deliver a talk to an audience. That's a really bad way of thinking about it. You're actually engaged in a conversation with an audience. Even if they're not talking, they're nodding and shifting position and you know looking like this or and you can you can pull all that in and and, and use it to govern the level at which you're addressing the entire audience. So the last thing I would say is, well, having the aim to be a good communicator is a good start. And you think, well, I could buttress that to some degree. And there isn't anything that you can possibly, this is the whole point of a liberal education. There isn't anything that you can possibly do that makes you more competent in everything you do than to learn how to communicate. I don't care if you're going to be a carpenter. I mean, being a carpenter, by the way, is very difficult, especially if you're a good carpenter. But if you're good at communicating as a carpenter, you're like 10 times better as a carpenter. So the, and this is something that the liberal arts colleges, I think, have, I don't know if they've forgotten it, but they don't do a very good job of marketing. It's like, well, what's the use of a bachelor's degree, a bachelor of arts? It's like, well, you can think, you can write, you can speak, you've read something. It's like the economic value of that is incalculable. The people that I've watched in my life who've been spectacularly successful are, they have skills, clearly. That, that's a minimum precondition. But they're also very, very good at articulating themselves. And so whenever they negotiate, they're successful. Well, that's kind of like the definition of success in life, right? You negotiate and you're successful. It doesn't mean you win, because if you're a good negotiator, if you're a really good negotiator, everybody walks away from the negotiation thrilled. And so then people line up to do things with you. So, and that's all, that's all dependent on your ability to communicate. So practice. There's a great hunger for information that is practical and useful and that helps people find meaning in their lives and orient themselves. There's a great hunger for that. And most of my lectures were derived from solid psychology, some of it experimental, some of it biological, some of it from, from, from the domains of neuroscience, a lot of it from great clinicians. It's not surprising that people find it helpful because, yeah. well, great <laughs> clinicians were great because they were really helpful. And so to distill that and to offer it to people in a digestible form, to have that have a good effect on them, well, that's, that's what you'd expect. That's what the whole discipline is about. And so that's been, that's been great. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday and not to who someone else is today. Yeah, because if you're comparing yourself to someone else, I mean, first of all, you don't know very much about the life of the person you're comparing yourself to. You don't know it, you know it across all of its dimensions. And second, people are very different. And so comparing yourself to someone else it's, it's kind of useful, I guess, when you're young, but as you get older and more singular and more particular, it becomes increasingly less useful. Better to compare yourself to a previous version of yourself and work for improvement in that way. Here's an impossible thing. Why don't you go out and fail? You say, here's something worth going after. 
Here's a step you could take that would push you beyond where you are, but that you also have a reasonably high probability of succeeding at. Mm -hmm. Right? They call that within the, a time frame. Within yeah, yeah. some time frame. That's the other thing. You have to parameterize it with regards to time frame. That's right. And that puts you in the zone of proximal development. And that's a that's a concept that was generated by a guy named Vygotsky. He was a Russian developmental psychologist and a smart one. It's where the idea of the zone comes from, mm, to be in the zone. Yes. And when you're in the zone, you're expanding your skills at, in a manner that's intrinsically rewarding because you're succeeding. And so you want to set, if you're good to yourself, you think, okay, I need to set a goal, but I need to set a goal that someone as stupid and useless as me could probably attain if they put some effort into it. Right. And then, you got, then you've got it perfectly because it's not so high that it's grandiose or impossible that you fail necessarily and then justify your bitterness. It's like, well, I could do, well, because that, that happens to people. <laughs> happens and, all the time. Yeah, it's like. I see this all the time. You know, it's like, it's, yes, exactly. Well, I set a goal and I didn't attain it, so I'm not gonna set any more goals. Right. It's like, no, you set a goal that was inappropriate. For the you, time frame. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right, you didn't calibrate it properly. Yeah. And, and you're playing a trick on yourself because you wanted to fail so that you could justify not having to try. Well. And being a victim, mm -hmm. yeah. Which isn't even helpful, you're still gonna be a victim. It's yeah. like, there's no way out of that, man. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, because life is this, life is a challenge that in some sense can't be surmounted. So there's no way out of your problem. But there are certainly proper ways of dealing with it. Yeah. Life is difficult and you cannot protect your children. What you can do is prepare them and you can prepare them to be strong and courageous and truthful and resilient and reciprocal in their interactions with other people. And that means you equip them for what life will be, which is a, at minimum a series of difficult challenges and, and often more than that, because of course people go through very difficult times in their lives. And a, a resilient person is capable of standing up to things in the face of fear and moving forward voluntarily, convinced of their own competence and ability to prevail. and. So the primary, your primary goal as a parent, apart from facilitating your child's social desirability, which is a major obligation on your part, is to encourage your children and to, and I mean that literally, to instill in them a sense of courage in the face of the difficulties of life and not to protect them from that. We don't even want to be protected from those difficulties because a major part of life and its meaning is the the challenge that comes with confronting difficulties. There is definitely an epidemic of overprotective parenting. But it's useful to ask why. And my suspicions are is that this is driven by very fundamental biological and cultural phenomena that aren't generally considered in relationship to this issue. We don't have very many children. We don't have 12, you know, six of whom die. We have one or two, and that makes them very precious, right? We're unwilling to take risks with them, and no wonder. And then we also have them much later in life. And so, like, if you have a kid when you're 18, you're still a kid, you know, you're gonna go out and have your life, right? Because you're so, well, you're in the, in the height of your exploratory, you're in the height of the exploratory part of your life. You're not going to overprotect your kid because you're still a kid. But if you're 40 and you have one child, it's like all your eggs are in one basket. Yeah. And the probability that you're going to take undue risks with that precious person is very, very low. Now, obviously, there's some advantages to that because, great, you devote resources to your child, you know, and foster their development. But the, the downside is that you have every motivation to hover. And maybe you're also extraordinarily desperate as a mother to maintain that bond with your child because you've struggled so long to achieve it. It's highly, highly valuable. You can't take a risk. Well, so these, so we might say, well, perhaps overprotective parenting is a secondary and unintended consequence of the birth control pill and the fact that people now have children later in life. Could easily be. You know, if you have six kids, it's like, what are you going to do, Hi helicopter parent them? It's like, no, you're so tired you can't even get off the couch if you have six kids. And they're, they outnumber you, right? They're raising each other. They're competing and they're taking each other down a peg. They're not, there's no overprotection there. But with a, with a single child landscape, 
or dual child landscape, mostly a single child landscape, then you're going to overprotect. And then that ethos starts to permeate the schools and it starts to permeate the higher education institutions as those children mature. And then that all reinforces it. It's not good. It's not obvious what to do about it either, because if it is driven by demographics in that, in that sense, it's a much more intractable problem than we think. So I did some of that in 12 Rules for Life. You know, I said, look, you, what you have to understand is that you're a danger to your children no matter what, right? You can let them go out in the world and be hurt, or you can overprotect them and hurt them that way. So you, you, here's your choice. You can make your children competent and courageous, or you can make them safe. But you can't make them safe because life isn't safe. So if you sacrifice their courage and competence on the altar of safety, then you disarm them completely. And all they can do is pray to be protected. Do you have to move from point A to B in life, but point A is often a very difficult place to be because we're fragile and bounded and mortal and limited and because we know that. And so one of the Implications of that, as many great religious traditions are at pains to illustrate or demonstrate or proclaim, is that life is essentially suffering. And I believe that to be a fundamental truth. But, but perhaps not the most fundamental truth, because I think the most fundamental truth is that despite the fact that life is suffering, people can transcend that. And partly the way they transcend that is by pursuing things of value. And so that if there is no value proposition at hand, then you have no meaning to justify the difficult conditions of your life. And that's brutally difficult for people. You know, Nietzsche said, um, he who has a why can bear any how. And you see, and, and I've certainly seen this as a clinical practitioner, that people who have no purpose in their life are embittered by the difficulties of their life. And they become first bitter and then resentful and then revengeful and then cruel. And there's plenty of places to go past cruel. That's just where you start if you're really on a downhill path. That you have a certain delightful, wonderful, positive freedom as a child, and then that's given up as you approach adulthood. But the truth of the matter is, is that you have a lot of potential as a child, but none of that is capable of manifesting itself as freedom before you become disciplined. And discipline is a matter of the imposition of order, and the order is necessary, especially for people who are hopeless and nihilistic. And lots of people are hopeless and nihilistic. Way more people than you think. And part of that is because no one's ever really encouraged them. And so the book is in part a matter of encouragement. It's like, lay yourself, lay a disciplinary structure on yourself. Get the chaos in, in, in check. And then you can move towards a state that's freer. Because it's discipline first. Like, look, if you're going to become a concert pianist, there's going to be several thousand hours of extraordinarily disciplined practice. That's the imposition of order on your potential, let's say. You know, if you start with the presumption that there's a baseline of suffering in life and that that can be uh, exaggerated by, as a consequence of human failing, as a consequence of malevolence and betrayal and self-betrayal and deceit and all those things that we do to each other and ourselves that we know that aren't good, that amplifies the suffering. That's sort of the baseline against which you have to work. And, and, and it's contemplation of that often that makes people hopeless and depressed and anxious and overwhelmed and yeah. all of that, and, and, and they have the reasons. But you need something to put up against that. And what you put up against that is meaning. Meaning is actually the instinct that helps you guide yourself through that catastrophe. And most of that meaning is to be found in the adoption of responsibility. So if you think, for example, if you think about the people that you admire, mm. well, you think about when you have a clear conscience first, because yeah. that's a good thing to aim at, which is something different than happiness, right? Um, a clear conscience is different than happiness. Yeah, it's better. Yeah. That's you're not better. Like guilting yourself, you're not feeling bad about yourself. That's right. You feel yeah. that you've justified Clean. you've justified your existence, yeah. right? And so you're not waking up at three in the morning in a cold sweat thinking about all the terrible things that you've involved yourself in. Mm. What you, you know, said to someone that you shouldn't have said, mm -hmm. or how you acted, or mm -hmm. lied. What or opportunity deceit. you lost or or, mm -hmm. or or yeah, or or the things that you've that you've let go that you should have capitalized on mm -hmm. and all of that. And so if you think about the times when you're at peace with yourself with regards to how you're conducting yourself in the world, it's almost always 
conditions under which you've adopted responsibility, mm. right? At least the most, the most guilt I think that you can experience perhaps is the sure knowledge that you're not even taking care of yourself so that you're leaving that responsibility to other people because that's pretty pathetic and I, unless you're psychopathic and you know and, and you're living a parasitical life and, mm -hmm. and that that characterizes a very small minority of people and an even smaller minority think that's justifiable but most of the time you're in guilt and shame because you're not you're you're not not only are you not taking care of yourself let's say so someone else has to but you're not living up to your full potential and so there's a existential weight that goes along with that people have an an unspecified potential for development, educationally, obviously, with regards to the skills they have, but also in relationship to their character. And it's, it's, much, it's much more encouraging for people, I think, to concentrate on who they could be rather than who they are, especially when they're young, because they still have most of their life ahead of them and, and they're not everything they could be yet. And so, to tell people even something like, well, you should feel good about yourself the way you are, it's like, well, that there's something there that's seriously lacking because there's so much more that you could be, that you need to be, and that you should be aiming at. The thing is, the problem with being okay the way you are is that you don't have a goal then. And people need to have a goal in order to, to come to terms with their life. This the baboon here, who's supposed to be basically just a fool when the story was first written, he turned into what's essentially a shaman across time. And the, so he represents the self from the Jungian perspective. Now the self is everything you could be across time. So imagine that there's you and there's the potential inside you, whatever that is, you know. And potential is an interesting idea because it represents something that isn't yet real, yet we act like it's real. Because people will say to you, you should live up to your potential. And that potential is partly what you could be if you interacted with the world in a manner that would gain you the most information, right? Because you build yourself out of the information in the Piagetian sense. But it's deeper than that too, because we know that if you take yourself and you put yourself in a new environment, new genes turn on in your nervous system. They encode for new proteins. And so you're full of biological potential that won't be realized unless you move yourself around in the world into different challenging circumstances, and that'll turn on different circuits. So it's not merely that you're incorporating information from the outside world in the constructivist sense. It's that by exposing yourself to different environments, you put different physiological demands on, on yourself all the way down to the genetic level, and that manifests new elements of you. And so one of the things that happens to people, and this is a very common cultural notion, is that you should go on a pilgrimage at some point to somewhere central, and that would be, say, like the rock in the Pride Rock in the Lion King, because you take yourself out of your dopey little village, and that's just the little bounded you that everyone knows and that isn't very expanded, and then you go somewhere dark and dangerous to the central place, and while you do that, you have adventures and they toughen you and pull more out of you, like partly because you're becoming informed, which means information. It means you're becoming more organized at every level of analysis, but there's also more of you too primary motive as a clinical psychologist and educator is to help individuals live more meaningful and productive lives in harmony with their families and their community. That's my motive. And the evidence for that, I think, is, well, if people go online, and first of all, you can watch the lectures and decide for yourself, but you can also go, there's, I suspect, probably maybe 250,000 people have commented on the lectures and their effects on them. And so, that's what people say. I'm watching the lectures. Yeah. I'm trying to develop a vision for my life. I'm trying to become more responsible and it's really helping. And that's, and that's what I hear all the time when I do these public lectures, like, which, which aren't political. But when we gain success, we raise the bar. We yes. set our ambitions higher. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is your end game? What do you want? That's all. That's what I want. I want, I want to help as many individuals as possible become more courageous, more truthful and more engaged in the pursuit of individual, familial and social harmony. That's what I want. Yeah, great job of Thank modeling you. courage in the face of fire. Well, there's something I'd like to say, maybe in closing about courage. People say that to me and you know, I, I don't think it's exactly right. There's a, there's a line in the Old Testament, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. 
And I think it's more like that. It's not that I'm courageous, it's that I'm afraid of the right things. So when I made my videos, it wasn't like that didn't make me nervous, but I was less nervous about going back to bed and not saying what I had to say than I was about making the videos because I know where this is going. I don't want to go there. And so it's, it's not so much courage. It's that it's a matter of, I, it's, it's, it's less risky to say something than to remain silent when you know there's something to be said. I know that to be the case. And so lots of times in life, it's like, there's no pathway forward that's going to shield you from risk. You get to pick this risk or you get to pick this risk. And I think I picked the lesser risk. And that might be wise, but I'm not so sure it's courageous. Assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't. This is a chapter about conversation and about the different forms conversation takes. And it's a chapter about humility. And it's a chapter about listening. And the humility element is, it took me a long time to understand why there's religious injunctions supporting humility. But to even understand what the word really meant in that sort of technical sense. And it means something like this. It means what you don't know is more important than what you know. And, and that's a lovely thing to, then, then what you don't know can start to be your friend, you see. People are very defensive about what they know, and for the reasons we've already discussed. But the thing is, you don't know enough. And the re you can tell you don't know enough because your life is not what it could be, and neither is the life of the people around you. You just don't know enough. And so what that means is that every time you encounter some evidence that you're ignorant, someone points it out, you should be happy about that because you think, oh, you just told me how I'm wrong. It's like, great. Like maybe I had to sift through a lot of nonsense to get through the real message that you're telling me. But if you could actually tell me some way that I'm wrong and then maybe give me a hint about how to not be wrong like that, well, then I wouldn't have to be wrong like that anymore. That, that would be a good thing. And, and you, can, you, can, you can embark on that adventure by listening to people. And if you listen to people, they will tell you They'll tell you amazing things if you listen to them, and many of those things are little tools that you can put in your toolkit, like Batman, and then you can go out into the world and use those tools, and you don't have to fall blindly into a pit quite as often. And so the humility element is, well, do you want to be right, or do you want to be learning? And, and, and it's deeper than that. It's, do you want to be the, the tyrannical king who's already got everything figured out, or do you want to be the continually transforming hero, or fool for that matter, who's getting better all the time? And that's actually a choice, you know. Um, it's a deep choice, and it's better to be the self-transforming fool who's humble enough to make friends with what he or she doesn't know, and to listen when people talk. And listening is a transformative exercise. Like if, if you listen to the people in your life, for example, if you actually listen to them, They'll tell you what's wrong with them and how to fix it and what they want. They can't even help it if you start listening because people are so shocked if you actually listen to them that they, they tell you all those sorts of things that they might not have even intended to, things they don't even know. And then you can, you can work with that. 